It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped his towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realise what I am doing, but later you understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have a bath need only to wash their feet. The whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you are. For he knew what he was doing. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, uh, you will be blessed if you do them. I'm not referring to you all. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill the, this passage of scripture. He who shared my bread, he that has turned against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. How would we find God in this world? And if he's there, how would we know if he cares a jot about us anyway? What would he have to do to show us that he loves us? Is God hiding away? Whereas Wally provides some of you with minutes of uh, amusement and some of us with hours of frustration. That's why I like this coronavirus lockdown version of uh, Where's Wally? But finding God is obviously more, vastly more significant in our lives. And does he love us? We know Rishi Sunak loves us because he's just spent 30 billion on us. He's paid for some of us to stay at home and we've had our wages anyway. And from August, then if we go out to eat at the sofa grill, then half the meal will be on Rishi Sunak. And surely if God loved us, he would just take away coronavirus just like that. And he would make us all healthy and wealthy and happy. Now we're looking at uh, encounters with Jesus in John's Gospel and we've reached chapter 13. I've realised that John is a very, very careful writer. It's not like he's writing an exam answer where he just splurges out everything he knows, hoping to pick up a few marks for the facts. He's very careful. Exams, if you remember, are the things you used to have to do in order to get qualifications in the old world. But this chapter is carefully written in a number of different ways. For a start, John gives us the words of Jesus, Amen, Amen, which we've come across a number of times in our series uh, already. When Jesus is getting really serious about something, he says them, Amen, Amen. It means in Aramaic or in Hebrew, certainty, or definitely, or more literally, to be trusted. You can bet your life on this. So it's there in verse 16, our man, our man, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master. It's there in the core, the kernel of the chapter, verse 20 and 21, and it's there at the end of the chapter, the end of the second section in verse 37. And the core really divides the chapter into two, and the halves are balanced. So on each side, 
the first half and the second, you get Peter just being on a totally different page from Jesus. And you also get references to Judas, the betrayer. And in the center, you get what this chapter is about. Verse 19, Jesus says, I'm telling you now before it happens, so that when it does, you will believe that I am. That is the name of God. You see, Jesus is a very unlikely God, a very unlikely hero. After all, who gets betrayed by a friend and crucified by your enemies? Not most gods that I know. Jesus is saying, you'll know that I am God because I've told you this in advance. And when you believe in me, then you will go on to love one another. That's the love that flows out of the faith. This shouldn't really be a surprise because John tells us at the end of his gospel why he's written. And he says, I've written these things and selected them so that you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. And that's what this chapter is about as well. Let's go back to the beginning. So we see verses 1 to 17. Jesus' disciples know he is God by his humble, cleansing love. The Passover has come around the third time in John's Gospel. And uh, Jesus knows that the clock is ticking down. His hour is coming, as we were thinking last week. And he's going to show his disciples the full extent of his love. He's going to love them to the end, love them to the death. He knows that the Father has put all things into his power. And so what's he going to do? Is he going to have a big farewell dinner so that his adoring followers can worship him? He can go out in a blaze of glory. Is he the crown prince of heaven, the heir of the universe, the son of God, going to put on some great display of power? He has come down to our pit. He is now returning to his father's palace and he's going to go out to show the world that he means business. Donald Trump on his uh, 4th of July speech to the American people uh, uh, said this. They think that the American people are weak and soft and submissive. But no, the American people are strong and proud and they will never allow our history and our culture to be taken from them. Well, Judas would have loved that. And to be fair, so would we all, because we all like to be on the side of strength and we all like the world to see that we're in a position of power to have to take us seriously. But no, Jesus knows that the Father has given him power over all things. And so he strips and stoops and serves. Amazing God he is. I know it's very nice today, but uh, remember when we had our summer, it was really hot for a couple of weeks and I took to wearing my sandals and they were so comfortable I forgot that I was wearing them until one evening Anne and I were watching TV before we went to bed and we both became very aware of my sandals. Now, the streets of Sutton are cleaned quite regularly. We don't have uh, mules or goats or donkeys wandering around the streets of South Sutton. But my feet definitely needed a foot spa. And the disciples even more so, because they were just about to eat together. In those days, the Romans had a fashion of having a low table in a U shape. and. Um, uh, the diners would lean on their left elbow, but they would use their neighbour uh, as a sort of couch. Now, your feet would be away from the table to a certain extent. Don't try this when you go out to the sofa girl, by the way. Uh, it's not social distancing. But uh, your feet would still be pretty near your neighbour's nostrils. Somebody definitely needed to wash their feet. This, however, is such a demeaning job that the rabbi said that no Jewish master should ever expect his servant to do this for him. So the disciples are looking around at each other. Perhaps they're thinking, well, Jesus will pick somebody to do this job. And clearly Jesus will indicate who the runt of the disciples is. 
but rather he takes off his outer garment and he takes the basin of water. Now it's very nice to have your hot smelly feet in a bowl of water and it's lovely to have someone pat them dry and get between the toes. Not so good for the one doing the washing though. And also it's actually quite embarrassing to have your feet washed in this way, isn't it? I mean, there are not many people I'd really want to get their hands on my dirty, smelly feet. But Jesus does this job. Now, Peter feels that uh, this is too embarrassing. He's got uh, his response when Jesus comes around to him. He knows exactly what he's going to say. But Jesus says, uh, no, 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 unless I wash you, verse 8, you have no part of me. Peter then says, uh, not being one to do, not being a person to do things by heart, he says, well, in that case, Lord, not just my feet, but wash me all over. And Jesus says, well, if you've had a bath and you've walked out to your friend's house, you only need to have your feet washed. But you do need to be washed. Jesus is washing his disciples' feet as a sign, as an object lesson. He says this is a hupadegma, and uh, that means um, it's something I'm showing you, which actually stands for the thing that I'm really going to do for you. If washing feet is humbling and you have to become a servant, being crucified is absolutely humiliating, not to say excruciating, literally. And this is what Jesus was going to do, not just to wash our feet, but to wash all of us, to wash our souls, to wash our hearts, to wash our imaginations, our minds. And that's where it needs to start between you and Jesus, me and Jesus, to stand before the cross, to see him take our sins and to let him get his hands on our ingrained dirty habits and imaginations and thoughts and attitudes. That's a bit embarrassing, although it's wonderful when you're washed by Jesus. Now, Judas is there at the meal and there's a contrast between him and Jesus. See, Jesus washes Judas' feet as long with the other disciples, but Judas actually lifts his heel literally against Jesus. This is um, what Jesus says, verse uh, 18, He who shared my bread has turned against me. Literally, as the New International Version margin says, he's raised his heel against me. He's shown me the bottom of his heel as a gesture of contempt. If I'd had £5,000 to spend on a piece of art, this is what I would have bought. It's actually a carving by a Palestinian craftsman from Bethlehem of this very scene in John chapter 13. And when I saw it, all kinds of things made sense to me. So Jesus is at the head of the table and he is flanked by John, the writer, the beloved disciple on one side and on the other, Judas. That's why when he says, one of you is not clean, one of you is going to betray me, all the disciples are looking at each other. They can't believe what Jesus has just said. And Peter motions to John and he says, ask him who he means. And so John just leans up and he whispers in Jesus' ear, who is it, Lord? And Jesus says, so that Judas can hear, but the rest of the disciples can't. He's protecting Judas at this time, because if they know he's the bet betrayer, the traitor, then Peter could easily kill him. He says, it's the one who I give the dip to. And he gives it to Judas. Judas is planning his exit. Why? Because he realizes that although he's thought that Jesus is going to conquer Jerusalem and the world. Actually, he's back to loser. Now Jesus is talking about dying. And he's planning to make his getaway and recoup some of the lost years and the lost money. It's a terrible act of betrayal. And yet Jesus shows love to him. 
And Jesus shows love to each of his disciples, most of all by going to the cross and there washing us clean from our foulness that's in our souls. What amazing love. And that's how he shows who God is too. Now we're going to have our reading as we move into the second part of John 13 to show our response. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, Ask him which one he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then, dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, What you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out and it was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In the first half of the chapter, we saw that we can recognise that Jesus is God by his humble, serving love, which cleanses us. And it is a wonderful thing to be cleansed by Jesus. Okay, it is a little bit embarrassing to bring our sins and the deepest secrets sometimes of our lives to him to be cleansed at the cross, but it's wonderfully cleansing and freeing. But when we've been to Jesus and to his cross and been cleansed, then we respond to him as our Lord and teacher as well as our Saviour. And we see in the second half of the chapter that the world knows Jesus' disciples by our humble serving love to one another. Verses 20 to 38. I was uh, reading of a, a man this week who two months ago was put into an induced coma because he had COVID-19 and he was given just 2% chance of survival and he was given 10 minutes virtually with his family before he was put out and uh, what would you say if you just had 10 minutes for your final words to those that you love the most. So these words are very, very important uh, from Jesus. And his words are, a new command I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now the new command was not really the command to love because that's in the Old Testament. The book of Leviticus says you must love your neighbor as you love yourself. But what is new here is the standard of the love, even higher than loving yourself. Jesus says you're to love one another as I have loved you. And that raises the bar to an entirely new level of love. Now is Jesus' priority to love your brother and sister Christian, to love his family, your family, as he has loved you? Is that your priority? Is it mine? Because we can be too busy to love. And in that case, we are just too busy. 
one or two things that love is not, which we see here from Jesus' example. First of all, love is not tolerance, although that's how the world interprets it usually today. I love you, so I'll let you do exactly what you want to do, and I won't criticize you, and I won't try to change you. But Jesus' love is a cleansing love. And if we love one another, actually we all come out of this cleaner, more like Christ. And secondly, uh, love is not a feeling. It's not feeling all lovey-dovey and warm sentiments to other people. Love is not not a feeling, but first of all, love is humble serving, putting ourselves out for others to meet their needs, the things that they really have which we can do for them. And thirdly, love is not doing nice things for nice people. It's not uh, doing nice things for people we like who are people like us. Love goes to people who are not like us and we have no natural affinity for. I knew uh, a lady when she got married, her mother-in-law just rejected her entirely and when she and her husband visited uh, her in-laws, then her mother-in-law wouldn't even lay a place for her at the dinner table. But when that lady got old, the mother-in-law, and she was housebound, couldn't really do anything for herself, the lady, uh, my acquaintance, drove 45 miles every week to her mother-in-law to attend to all of her needs, to clean for her, to do her washing, to give her a, 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 a bed bath. That is real love. That's the sort of love with which Jesus has loved us and with which he expects us to love one another. Love means looking out for each other, taking initiative to serve one another. If we have finance or to give encouragement or time or inclusion to people who need our resources, our company, our friendship. This is the love by which other people will recognize that we indeed are followers of Jesus and the mission of Jesus will go on in this world through us and more and more people will recognize, ah, this carpenter of Nazareth who taught so magnificently, who lived a life like no others, who gave his life on the cross and who raised, uh, was raised to life again. He's alive today through his people because we don't see this sort of love and service anywhere else in the world. Now the world is crying out for unity and diversity, isn't it? How do we bring everybody together as one? Well, this is how, as we follow Jesus. You know, T'Challa in the uh, movie uh, Black Panther said this, in times of crisis, we must build bridges while the foolish build barriers. We must find ways to look after one another as if we were one single tribe. And when we, as Jesus brothers and sisters, do this for one another, then people will recognize that he is Lord, that he is God. He is the one to follow and worship. And that's the response which we are to make to his great act of love and service for us. Now, if we are close to Jesus, this will happen. We will begin to serve other people as he has served us. And Jesus says, pay my love forward. Not pay it back to me, but pay it forward to one another. Pass my love on. That is the response of what he has done for us. And that's the blessed life. See, Jesus not only tells us who he is, uh, that we might believe in him as God himself, the I am. He not only tells us the response which he's looking for, but he tells us 
now that you've heard these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. This is the good life. This is the happy life. You know, there are two blessings that John gives us in his gospel, and both of them are connected. The second one is in chapter 20. When Thomas has recognised that Jesus is indeed Lord and God back from the dead, Jesus says, well, you've seen and you've believed, but blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believed. The first blessing is given to those who will trust him and believe in him. And the second blessing is for those who will follow him and live a life of love as he has lived a life of love. Now that you know these things, you will indeed be blessed if you do them. The blessed life is the life that trusts Jesus and gives to others.